very good morning to all of you. Uh, thank you all for making it uh, on early morning uh, to, to discuss uh, and deliberate on informational privacy in India. Uh, to just give a quick you know, overview of uh, how we started thinking about this event, uh, there were several conversations that we've had uh, with particularly uh, you know, personnel working in the embassies in India and uh, who are really interested in knowing how India is going to deal with personal data. So the very thought behind this uh, conference was to, uh, to see how we can provide being a city with a lot of experts you know, who are working on this subject, how the Center for Policy Research could uh, serve as a convening platform to bring together these experts and provide some guidance to the various embassies uh, and in, in understanding how the Indian ecosystem is evolving and how from privacy to data protection that you know whole linkage is sort of evolving and uh, we all know broadly through newspaper items and what is really happening around us that these are very interesting times for personal data protection in India. Uh, so that's the context and uh, thankfully we, we got uh, some generous support from the Omidyar network the moment we said we are thinking of something like this, uh, the, the digital identity team at Omidia Network was willing to uh, support us. And, and uh, uh, at, at that time, we also felt that the other function, apart from knowledge sharing around personal data protection, should also be to highlight some of the wonderful scholarship that uh, many uh, Indian scholars are now doing in this uh, space. Uh, so let me just, uh, before I begin my presentation, also highlight the fact that in our welcome kit, uh, apart from the personal data protection bill, we also have this reading material which contains some illustrative examples of that kind of scholarship. I mean, there is amazing work now being done by Indian scholars on data localization, on surveillance and so on, and many of them are here today uh, presenting their work uh, before you. Uh, so with that, let me uh, start uh, this event uh, uh, with, with a short you know, presentation on how informational privacy is, is evolving and where we are and how we, will, we would probably be uh, going forward with it and then you know have our uh, speakers for the first panel. Uh, so just to give a quick overview, uh, I think what is really a watershed moment uh, today is you know post uh, August 2017 when the first uh, Puttaswamy verdict came out by the Indian Supreme Court. So the whole idea of constitutionalizing privacy is, you know, is, is, is what has really made privacy sort of important, I mean very important and uh, within that the whole idea of informational privacy being a fundamental right. And the reason this is uh, important is because there has been a lot of divergence and dissonance between various Supreme Court decisions previously before Puttaswamy on whether privacy is a fundamental right at all. Uh, I mean in the early days, you know, we have seen uh, uh, some of our uh, judges and constitution bench decisions holding that uh, privacy is not a fundamental right. And then we have later three judge benches, you know, of the court holding that privacy is indeed a fundamental right. And this was very ambiguous. The status of privacy as a fundamental right was quite ambiguous. And interestingly, what happened in the interim period is the whole, you know, technology uh, component being added in. And Aadhaar is a very good example of, uh, or it's probably the first, you know, sort of move in that direction, particularly in a from a governance standpoint. And, and what really happened is this massive gathering of biometric information without, in, in, may, in many cases, a law being in place at the time when Aadhaar was being rolled out initially. The law only came out in 2016, while the rollout of Aadhaar started from 2011. Right? And, and uh, then there were challenges, of course, uh, to this uh, initiative by the state. And it is in the context of that challenge that, you know, uh, privacy became an important uh, ground of challenge and then, you know, the state responded that it's not a part of your fundamental right, uh, relying on some of the earlier Supreme Court decisions. So, uh, in 2017, the, uh, the Supreme Court, by a nine-judge bench verdict, unanimously brought, a, you know, closure to that issue by holding that privacy is an inalienable and natural right. It is part of our fundamental rights under Part 3 of the Constitution and, you know, is, a, is an interesting, intrinsic and core feature of life and personal liberty. Uh, the interesting thing about the judgment is that it conceptualizes privacy as an important right to express some of your other rights, such as, you know, the, the right to think independently, the right to dissent, the right to make your own choices. None of these rights are meaningful without you being able to operate in a private zone which is separate from where the state or even technology companies can, you know, inter interfere with your lives. Uh, 
right? But of course, when you're talking about the fundamental rights context, the one thing to bear in mind is that you are, you are talking about rights that are enforceable against the state, right? And, and in that context, uh, the court also basically held that dignity is an, is an important component of your right to life and privacy is an expression of dignity. I mean, you cannot enjoy, you know, human dignity without privacy being guaranteed under the constitution. Uh, the other important thing to keep in mind is that uh, the court interpreted the constitutional provisions in the light of some of India's international commitments like under the ICCPR and uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and so on and, and where you know, privacy is recognized as fundamental to uh, constitutional values. Uh, the, uh, so, I mean, as we all know, there is no concept of a right that is absolutist, right? I mean, there is, there is rights and there, there are restrictions that are permissible on, on these rights. Uh, so that's where the court has basically laid down something called the triple test to think about what could be a permissible exception to privacy, uh, privacy rights and uh, the, the triple test entails asking these, you know, three different uh, questions in a stage, uh, in a phased manner. Uh, one, whether there is a law in place. And as I mentioned earlier with Aadhaar, that itself was a huge concern till 2016. There was no law in place to, uh, to govern the gathering of biometric information. It was all done through executive orders and guide, guidelines given to the Aadhaar, various Aadhaar enrollment agencies all through the country. The second is to ask whether there is a legitimate state aim that is being pursued. So while you, know, you make these intrusions upon privacy, you, the state cannot do so unless there are some, you know, uh, there is a compelling state interest. And the third is to ask whether there is a proportionate measure or intrusion of privacy which necessitates this particular uh, intrusion. I mean, is this the least restrictive measure that you can em employ or is there an alternative measure that you can employ which is less restrictive and which does not intrude upon privacy in the same manner. Uh, so if you look at the uh, 2017 verdict, they, it has in fact uh, listed out some of these exceptions in the verdict. For instance, using data mining to channel public resources towards uh, rightful beneficiaries, digital platforms that can help good governance, crime prevention and investigation. These are three, you know, exceptions that are highlighted in the 2017 verdict. Uh, I mean, this is quite important because today we are talking about using big data for governance purposes. Uh, so to what extent can you do so? And uh, in the next panel, when we discuss the personal data protection bill, you'll see some of these exceptions play out and so on. Uh, but the, the broad point is that some of these exceptions uh, are recognized exceptions under the uh, Supreme Court verdict. But does it mean that if you meet these exceptions, you can do anything that you want with, private, with personal data? That's not the case because it still has to meet the proportionality test. And here, you know, things get a little interesting because if you look at the 2017 verdict which lays down uh, uh, privacy as a fundamental right and then you come to the 2018 Puttaswamy verdict, which upholds the constitutional validity of Aadhaar, there is a marked distinction between the way the court looks at the proportionality test in the earlier verdict and the proportionality test in the later one. Uh, so as I mentioned, you know, to just recap, the idea behind the test is to look at whether there can be uh, less restrictive measures employed by the state which achieve the same objective, right? So if you're gathering biometric information, is that the only way that you can, you know, uh, enhance uh, trust and the only way that you can, uh, you know, uh, direct uh, public resources to uh, specific individuals? Uh, so asking that question and the way that question has been asked in the 2017 verdict is kind of different from the way it has been asked in the 2018 verdict. In the 2017 uh, case, when, they were, when the nine judges were looking at whether privacy is a part of fundamental rights, uh, there were at least a few of them who thought that there must be strict scrutiny standard applied, which basically means a higher degree of standard when you're looking at state action. So if the state decides to use your personal data for certain reasons, uh, the, the, the question to then ask is, you know, whether this, this is, uh, you know, there is a compelling state interest and whether there is a less restrictive measure. And when you're doing that, you apply a strict scrutiny of the state action instead of just going by what the state makes as a claim. But if you look at the 2018 verdict, in many ways, the majority verdict has uh, particularly sort of gone by what assertions have been made by the state in the, in the various, you know, counter affidavits filed and then uh, taken it at face value and uh, taken the presumption of constitutionality as a much more uh, stronger principle than the proportionality standard and looking at it in a more searing manner. And this is just a table that sets out the differences. I can circulate the PPT later. Uh, so the, the table, as the table indicates, you know, there is uh, 
uh, difference in the way the court has articulated the standard in the 2017 verdict and the way it has applied it in the 2018 uh, verdict. I mean, if you look at, for instance, leg legitimate state aims, I mean, the court has basically in the 2018 verdict said that the right to food and, you know, the, uh, the various rights, the socio-economic rights, which Aadhaar was being used as a tool to direct to, these rights are, uh, Aadhaar is a manifestation of the right itself. So what you're talking about really here is a conflict between two different rights, right to privacy on the one hand and socio-economic rights on the other. Uh, instead of looking at Aadhaar as an exception to the right, in some ways the court has looked at Aadhaar as a manifestation of certain socio-economic rights and as a result of that the court has, I, I would uh, tend to uh, believe, uh, you know, given a lot more leeway to the, uh, to the state, to state action here. The other interesting question to ask when one engages with privacy is the role of consent. How important is taking individual consent to the privacy uh, framework in India? And here I would uh, tend to believe that there is a dual existence that consent has taken in the Indian context. One is when it comes to the state use of personal data and the other is when it comes to uh, private use of uh, personal data. And the reason I say this is because even in the 2017 verdict, the court has uh, looked at data protection as a sort of theme kind of separate from the privacy debates. While it says that data protection is an expression of privacy, it's also an expression of various other things such as, you know, the right of an individual towards uh, her autonomy, right? And, and while doing that, consent is central to this particular endeavor. And then there are observations uh, which I have mentioned here. Uh, which, which, tend to, uh, which tend to say that when, when you have a data protection regime in the country, consent is central to that regime. But the interesting thing is, you know, how it works when it comes to application of uh, personal data by the state itself. And there I, I would argue that, you know, there is a differential standard and is a weaker, you know, check. Uh, in fact, in many cases, you do not need to take consent. There are, even in the personal data protection bill, as you will see soon, uh, there are exceptions to uh, consensual processing. So there are non-consensual processing exceptions. And uh, most of these exceptions apply in the context of the state uh, rather than uh, private uh, industry. So uh, for private industry, there is one framework that you're talking about, which is uh, reliant around consent and makes consent central to the piece. And for the state's use of personal data, the Indian framing of privacy seems to be much more on other checks and balances rather than uh, consent itself. Uh, even with Aadhaar, that's, that's really the case. I mean, if you look at the uh, final uh, verdict where you can use Aadhaar for multiple different uh, state purposes without taking uh, consent so long as it meets a certain standard under the Aadhaar Act. The other set of concerns when we talk about privacy, and this goes to the history of privacy itself. I mean, so you have spatial privacy, you have decisional privacy, and then you come to informational privacy in the Indian uh, context today after the 2017 verdict. But even starting with the physical, you know, uh, privacy, spatial privacy, you know, co context, surveillance has always been a big fear when it comes to uh, personal uh, space. And data is one aspect of your personal space. Uh, so the 2017 judgment again looks at it from the context of uh, the technology industry and how it's uh, bringing in a kind of digital surveillance uh, regime, so to say. It, it mentions the various different ways in which technology is gathering data and then, uh, then you know, lists out possible responses, uh, but not in a detailed manner. Regulatory safeguards could be one kind of check and check to, to a digital surveillance regime. Data minimization is another kind of check purpose limitation to quickly explain. Regulatory safeguards is when you have a particular regulator that's looking at how you are using uh, uh, digital identity and the various schemes in which you are uh, linking these digital identities to. Uh, to come to the context of Aadhaar again, uh, Aadhaar, the Aadhaar number is seeded into multiple databases and then that is, you know, used for various uh, state purposes. And uh, the, the danger of that potentially is that there is one regulator, one entity which can see, you know, like and get a 360 degree view of a particular individual's activities and interaction with the state and even private players as was the case with Aadhaar before the Supreme Court verdict uh, recently. Uh, so. One is to bring in a regulator that looks at the practices of seeding Aadhaar numbers and linking it with multiple databases and so on. The second is to minimize the data itself that the state gathers. So one could say, for instance, that you do not take, you know, uh, 
uh, X kind of biometric information you only take, you know, a limited kind of biometric information. Or you do not take caste uh, information, you do not take religion, uh, information relating, relating to religion and so on. The third is purpose limitation, the various purposes for which you can uh, put to use uh, uh, digital identity or, uh, or a data or personal data regarding an individual that you have gathered. Like can you use it for a particular service delivery or can you use it for 10 different you know, uh, things such as enrolling your children in school, uh, using it for scholarships, using it for pensions and this was again what was happening with Aadhaar. So just to take a quick, uh, you know, look at what the, you know, uh, 2018 verdict basically says, the majority verdict. It, it says that, you know, Aadhaar does not have, uh, does not uh, pose too many surveillance uh, concerns because, you know, it's minimal biometric data that was being gathered. So there's data minimization at that level. Uh, it is purpose blind. It's not really, you know, looking at specific, uh, you know, uh, purposes in that sense. And, and it uh, is, uh, you know, basically keeping these databases separate uh, into different silos. And all of these assumptions can be challenged, have been challenged by petitioners in the past. And if you look at the dissenting verdict in the Aadhaar case, I mean, they, there is a pushback to these uh, assumptions and points made here. Uh, the other point that the majority verdict says is that there are strong security measures employed. Again, that may not be a good answer to surveillance concerns. Uh, simply because an efficient state does not mean that it respects privacy. I mean, these are completely different objectives that we are talking about. You could have a very efficient, uh, you know, regime. I mean, China is a good example of that. Uh, but that may not, uh, that may have all the data at, at its fingertips and may secure it perfectly well. But securing it to what end is a deeper question that one needs to ask. And the third, uh, you know, uh, point that uh, is important to keep in mind is the various modifications that the Supreme Court has suggested to the project, such as you cannot, you know, uh, uh, keep the authentication records for more than six months. Uh, you cannot, uh, you know, gather business metadata and most importantly, the purpose minimization. So there are two things that the court has basically done. One is to hold that, you know, you uh, 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 cannot use it for all kinds of state purposes. Uh, it, can, it has to be specific programmatic uh, uh, situations where you need the digital identity to target uh, public resources to specific individuals and it cannot be used for other purposes such as, you know, education and scholarships in that regard and all of that. Uh, and the other way in which the court has uh, minimized the purpose is to strike down private authentication. So Aadhaar was basically evolving as this uh, uh, project where, you know, it's part of the, uh, there's, a, there's this whole thing called the India Stack, which was a bunch of open APIs which could read into the Aadhaar database and then private entities could use that uh, data for, uh, could use the open APIs to build front end uh, uh, applications, uh, which would then, you know, use your Aadhaar details for onboarding uh, customers. And we have seen that happen in the context of multiple services in the past. Reliance Geo is, an, is a striking example that comes to mind. And the court has now basically held that private authentication is a strict uh, no at the moment. Uh, part of the reason could be that they see some technical issues with the way the uh, Aadhaar Act has come into being as, uh, as a money bill. Uh, but my reading of the verdict is that it goes deeper than that to basically say that if there are so many different, you know, entities, uh, private entities which can read into the Aadhaar database, it creates vulnerabilities on the security front and it creates vulnerabilities when it comes to the data minimization and purpose minimization principle. Uh, but the dissenting view is much stronger less optimistic about some of the cons uh, some of the factors that the uh, majority has highlighted to say that you know other is a is is a, is, a, is is fine from a privacy point of view uh, so with that i'll i'll uh, wind up my presentation uh, uh, i'll 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 just uh, take this opportunity now to call upon uh, our uh, first uh, panel uh, ms anjali bharadwaj mr ambar sinha and mr bhavin patel
for being here, taking the time out uh, for this discussion. Um, so Anjali, I'll just uh, begin with you because as I was mentioning, the the verdict uh, looks at you know privacy versus Aadhaar as a matter of two different rights competing with each other, right? And and in that context, we'd like to hear your thoughts about how uh, the verdict looks at welfare and how it looks at transparency because these are both at some level uh, expression of two different you know com competing rights, right to information on the one hand and socio-economic rights on the other. Would you like to? Thank you very much for having me here. Uh, some of us work on issues of transparency. I have worked with the National Campaign for People's Right to Information in India and also a group called Satark Nagrik Sangathan, which works at the grassroots in Delhi uh, with several uh, slum settlements and, and uh, civil society to look at issues of transparency, accountability, how they impact people. Um, we believe that both these rights, the right to information and the right to privacy, are very, very critical rights for people in any democracy. And what is really important is to be able to balance them in a manner that, that neither of those two fundamental rights, in a sense, is overshadowed or compromised by the other. Um, the right to information law, which was passed in India in 2005, really came about as a result of a very strong people's movement because people realized that unless they had information about what the government was doing, it was impossible for them to hold the government accountable. There was no way that they could have ensured that the rights and entitlements that were due to them would flow. And the right to information law which was passed actually is considered one of the most uh, progressive information legislations precisely because it does balance a lot of other rights uh, which are constitutionally guaranteed and otherwise important. So for example, there are exemptions that are built into the Right to Information Act. Section 8 of the law deals with exemptions, information that citizens cannot access. And one part of the exemptions deals with issues of privacy. So if there is unwarranted invasion of privacy of an individual, the right to information law states that that information cannot be accessed by people using the law. So the reason I wanted to sort of start with saying that is that to a lot of us and people who have been involved in drafting the law, the right to information law, because it did come from a people's movement, this was a concern that was taken on board at the time that the law was being drafted. In fact, I remember that when the, there was a draft of the law going around, the bill going around, um, there was a group of people who were working with HIV positive patients who came up and said that it's all very good to have uh, information out in the public domain, but given the kind of stigma, that social stigma that's attached to people being HIV positive in society, uh, it's very important to have these safeguards. And this has been built in. Now, if we look at the use of the right to information law, and, and some of this I wanted to talk about to also lay the context of understanding the Puttasami judgment, which, which uh, Anand has already sort of spoken about in some detail, the law has been used very extensively by people in India. In fact, um, the reason, uh, th there are nearly 6 million RTI applications that are filed every year in India. It's perhaps the most widely used transparency legislations globally. And the reason is that people understand the link between information and their ability to access their other rights and entitlements, including welfare benefits that otherwise are not accessible to them. So for example, when we started telling people in Delhi, in the slums, about the right to information law, uh, one of the first things that people wanted to use it for was to get their food entitlement that they are supposed to get under the public distribution system, the food uh, law now. 
and people said that we don't get our food supply, our full quota of rations, because we are told by the shopkeeper that the government hasn't sent your full quota of ration. So there were people who instead of getting 35 kilograms as they're supposed to get, would get just 3 kilograms or 5 kilograms or nothing at all, uh, because they had no way to fight back and say that, you know, this is an entitlement that should flow to me because the shopkeeper would say that the government hasn't sent your share of entitlement. So people used the RTI law and asked the government, the food department, for records of the ration shops. So the stock registers, when they were obtained, clearly showed that every month full quota of ration was reaching the shops. And the sale registers were a complete work of fiction. So what really helped people, they used this information for the first time they had proof of corruption. And using that, they, there was a huge public hearing that was organized with more than 500 beneficiaries of uh, the public distribution system who came together and held the government accountable. And suddenly from a place where people did not get their full entitlements, people started getting full entitlement in a timely manner. And it really established for people the importance and significance of information to be able to hold the government accountable. And that's really what we have seen, not just in the food program, but also in social security, old age pensions. People have used the RTI law to access the list of beneficiaries to find out how much is due to them when, what processes they're supposed to be adopted and so on. So that has really enabled people to fight the kind of corruption that we see in India. So in India, typically corruption sort of starts at the highest levels, but goes down right to the lowest levels where people can't get their basic entitlements unless they pay a bribe. So the right to information law has been used by citizens very effectively across the country to fight corruption and get what is rightfully theirs. Now, if we look at the implementation of the right to information law, unfortunately, the most illegally used exemption is Section 81J, which deals with privacy. So we have a government, and not just this government, but successive governments, which have used the privacy clause, which is there in the Right to Information Act, to exempt information uh, to actually deny illegally information to people. So we have all manner of information being denied to citizens which should have been provided. So for example, people have asked for the performance of the public servants. People have asked for assets, those who've been concerned about, let's say, judicial corruption or who've been concerned about corruption in high places want to know what are the assets of their public servants and whether they're disproportionate to their known sources of income. That sort of information has been denied uh, to people under the pretext of privacy. More recently, people have asked because they want to verify the educational qualifications of various ministers, the prime minister, and so on. They've asked for information from the Delhi University, for example, asking to share the results of of uh, these public servants, and all of it has been denied under the pretext of privacy using 81J in the RTI law. So we are seeing that a great deal of information which should have been, in fact, made available to people even proactively by the government is today being denied. Ration records are being denied now because the government has realized that this is one way by which people are getting empowered to hold the government accountable. So there is a real pushback. And even ration records, people are told that this, this would compromise the privacy of the shopkeeper, and therefore we cannot give you information. So there is denial, blatantly illegal denial, using privacy uh, of information. Now one would then be sort of led to believe that the Indian government or governments have been very, very concerned about privacy. But then, of course, like Anand mentioned, we have this huge rollout of the Aadhaar program, which first, of course, happened without any legal backing, any statutory backing, only on the basis of an executive order. And then finally, this government brought in a law, but the law was not debated. It was brought in as a money bill. It went without any public consultation, and then finally without even any discussion on the provisions of the bill in parliament. And, and this particular, under this program, people's 
very, uh, you know, detailed personal information is being collected for all citizens in the country, where your biometrics, your, you know, your iris scans, everything is happening, uh, you know, all this data is being collated. The state has, in fact, let out this kind of operation, contracted it to private operators, raising huge issues of privacy and surveillance and the other kinds of concerns that Anand already spoke about. So we then have this situation where the, the government, the same governments, which, which seem to be really particular about privacy when it comes to giving information which would help people hold the government accountable, is suddenly not so bothered about privacy. And in fact, when there was a challenge to Aadhaar, the government went on to say that there is no fundamental right to privacy. And if we look at the case for Aadhaar, where, where does it come from and what is the rationale that the government has given for collecting all this information, which, which could have serious ramifications on privacy and all sorts of other, uh, has all sorts of other issues as well, is that we need this kind of a database to fight corruption and to make sure that there is proper delivery of welfare programs and schemes. Now, uh, all, those of us who have been working for decades on the field on ensuring that people actually get their rights and entitlements, on working with people, mobilizing them to demand accountability from the government, don't really understand how a program of this kind would actually help fight corruption. Uh, the ground reality uh, you know, in terms of what is actually played out on the field is that there are large-scale exclusions because of Aadhaar. The first thing that the government, of course, said was that the reason why Aadhaar would be very useful for the poor is that many people don't have any identity proof, and Aadhaar will now, for the first time, give them proof of identity. Unfortunately, that stopped very early on, and in fact, there were RTI applications to ask how many people were given enrolled on Aadhaar who didn't have any previous proof of identity and the number was abysmal. It was way less than 1%. Uh, so what, what really happened was that we saw people were not really looking to queue up and get themselves enrolled onto this database. So the government then came up with this whole system of saying that you cannot access your rights and entitlements which are due to you from the government unless you enroll on this database. So what, what we are today talking about consent was completely missing because the way we had huge queues behind counters where the, uh, the uh, people were enrolling on the Aadhaar database was not because people were willingly reaching out. It was not because there was considered consent, but because it was coercion. And we have seen that what the governments did, for example, even in Delhi where we work, large number of people were left out of the food security program because the Delhi government said that you cannot enroll onto the food program unless you have an Aadhaar authenticated uh, you know, you're on that database. And all those who weren't on that database at that time were therefore left out of, of the food database and continue to be left out because by the time they got enrolled, the quota was finished. So there, there are huge exclusions because of Aadhaar. The other problem, of course, also is that in order to make sure that there's biometric verification, you need to have point of sale devices. So for example, when you're selling grains, somebody comes to the ration shop, unless their biometric is, is identified, you cannot give them their share of ration. And biometric identification through these point of sale devices is a disaster. It requires an, a working internet, which even in places like Delhi, there are a large number of places which don't have that. It requires that there should be electricity at the time when somebody's coming to get their rations and so on. And we are seeing that biometrics of people, especially people working on manual, doing manual labor, etc., are not matching in a very big, in a, in, in a very big scale. So people are getting excluded and there are, there are uh, studies to show and there are figures uh, um, about 25% of, of people who were enrolled onto the food program in Delhi could not access their rations when the Delhi government rolled out the point of sale device uh, uh, as, as being mandatory. It is disempowered citizens because what 
is finally happening is that it's pretty much pitting people against machines. So what, what, when earlier people used to go and they used to be denied their rations, they could stand and argue with the shopkeeper. Whereas now the shopkeeper simply has to say that, well, your biometric is not authenticated, even when it is authenticating, in fact. And just when people try to argue, they say, well, this is very complicated, can't really explain to you how the machine works and so on, and people are being denied their shares of rations, irrespective of whether they are on Aadhaar and through the POS uh, machines as well. And, and the model of fighting corruption that this is perpetuating is really a very centralized model, where somebody sitting somewhere will control corruption. It's disempowering citizens on the ground who otherwise were able to engage in an informed manner if they had information and could engage with people. The other thing that has happened is that, you know, we know that in terms of fraud, when it comes to identity fraud, that has been there, but it's been a very small percentage of the kind of problem and the fraud that we've seen in a program like the public distribution system. A majority of the problem and the corruption in the food program has been quantity fraud and quality fraud, which basically means I go to buy rations and instead of giving me 40 kilograms of grain, which I'm supposed to get, I'm given only four kilograms. There is no way being on Aadhaar or even a point of sale device can prevent that from happening. Because even today, even after authentication, I could be told by the shopkeeper that I only have four kilograms to give you. And take it or leave it, and which is what is actually happening on the ground. So there is really no evidence of corruption having gone down, but there have been claims. So for example, the prime minister on the floor of the parliament made a claim that because of Aadhaar and technology, four crore, about 40 million, bogus ration cards were found. Um, and he also claimed that 14,000 crore rupees was were saved because they cancelled all these bogus ration cards. Now, those of us who work on the ground were very worried because we know that even if there is one wrong cancellation of a ration card, it means that that family completely falls into destitution. So RTI applications were filed to verify the claims made by the Prime Minister. And unfortunately, in response to the RTI applications, there was no evidence that could be provided to back these claims. So when we asked for the state-wise list of names of people who were found to be bogus, the government could not come up with it. And whatever data came to us from the states did not match with what was presented in parliament. As a result, the parliamentary proceedings were rectified twice because there was nothing to really back up these, uh, the claims made by the prime minister. Similarly, claims of savings and fighting corruption were made by the education minister, who claimed that because of Aadhaar, 80,000 bogus university teachers were detected who were getting, apparently getting uh, their salaries, drawing them from several institutions. When somebody filed an RTI application saying, can you please give us the names of these people or the institutions where they were drawing these salaries from, again, the government could not come up with any information. And they went back quickly to say that these were data entry errors and, and there was really no corruption or savings that were established. And the most important thing is that if there is all this corruption that has been found using Aadhaar, where is the action against those officials who were indulging in corruption? So which is also a very big question mark to us because the way, only way to fight corruption is if those who are indulging in it are held account, to account. How can one fight corruption? We've you know, these are all the ways which have been demanded in India in the past over the, over the years. Transparency has been found to be one of the most effective ways to fight corruption. In fact, there are states in India where the food program started performing hugely better once there was proactive disclosure of information made. Simple things like putting out the names of beneficiaries in the public domain, putting out how much each family was supposed to get on as per government records in the public domain had a tremendous impact on fighting corruption. In states like Chhattisgarh, which, which did show an improvement 
in, in delivery of food grains showed that simple transparency mechanisms like putting a GPS tracker on the vehicle that was carrying rations for people and tracking it and making sure that people had access to that tracking so that they could monitor was greatly improving delivery of rations. Those are the kind of things that we really need to leverage. We, you know, one of the things that we often hear is that someone who sort of says that there's a problem with Aadhaar is often labeled anti-technology. But I think that the important thing here is that tech appropriate technology needs to be used. For example, most people have access access to mobile phones in large parts of the country. How does one make sure that they are empowered with information using appropriate technology and mobile phones? That's the kind of thing that can help fight corruption and make sure that welfare programs are properly implemented. Grievance redress, we have a huge problem with grievance redressal in India. So you file a complaint when you don't get your rights, you don't get your rations, you don't get your pensions, nothing happens to that complaint. It's like it goes into a black box. What we needed was a proper grievance redress mechanism, which was time bound, which was effective, which empowered people to take action against corruption when they saw it. Community monitoring, there has been a lot of social audits that have worked very fantastically to contain corruption, public hearings, there are models that have been evolved, that have been tested, which need to in fact be put in place. And finally, anti-corruption institutions where people which function independently are empowered and can actually make sure that when people come out and blow the whistle on corruption, action is taken. So these are the kind of things that we expected governments to put in place, especially this government which came on the plank of anti-corruption. It was hoped that all this will be done. So for example, the Lokpal which was set up as an anti-corruption body you know, it's been more than four years since the law was passed. Not a single Lokpal is in place right now. The whistleblower's protection was, law was passed. It hasn't been implemented. But what we have instead is the Aadhaar being touted as this large anti-corruption sort of machine, which, which has many, many problems. It, has, it is an untested technology, which is pretty much treating people when it comes to service delivery as guinea pigs. And finally, um, what we have also seen, and I think I, I won't go into the details because Anand already talked about the Puttasami judgment and, and uh, the requirements that it sort of placed upon the government in terms of making sure that Aadhaar is safe, that, that certain uh, safeguards are put in place. We now have a, a sort of move to build a data protection framework and the Justice Shri Krishna committee came up with a data protection bill. Now, unfortunately, what we are seeing is because Aadhaar is really being treated as something that has already been created, cannot be touched, the data protection framework, instead of really focusing on making sure that people's data is protected, is almost pr working to protect the Aadhaar infrastructure that has been put in place. So for example, of course the data protection uh, bill which has been brought about talks about consent, but when it comes to consent not being followed in the way, in the letter and spirit that it should have been an Aadhaar, it goes on to say, well, data which has already been collected is all right, so it doesn't apply retrospectively. So it's, it's really kind of looking like the data protection bill is looking to protect and save the Aadhaar infrastructure which has been built rather than protecting people's interest and privacy. The other issue, of course, is that the Data Protection Committee, the Justice Shri Krishna Committee itself had a very, very skewed representation. Um, we are not saying that it's nobody's case that civil society members who work on right to information, because after all, this was an information protection, you know, data protection uh, bill that was being created should have been brought on. But at least the central information commissioners, other information commissioners should have been brought on to be part of this sort of a committee. Because today, if we look at who has the maximum uh, sort of, uh, you know, experience in dealing with privacy issues, informational privacy issues, it would have to be information commissioners who are constantly dealing with privacy matters under the RTI law as well. Unfortunately, the, none of these 
uh, nobody who had any expertise on the right to information, its use, and, and informational privacy was actually brought in to be part of this committee. And what we have finally coming out of this committee in the form of a bill is something which looks to amend the existing RTI law. And basically what it does is that it, it redefines Section 81J, which deals with privacy in the law, and really lowers the threshold for, for exemption. So instead of saying that unwarranted invasion of privacy, if it happens, then information can be, uh, can be denied to people, it just goes on to say if there is likely harm if it is likely to cause harm to anyone, then information can potentially be denied. Now, that's a much lower threshold, and which would basically mean that public information officers are now going to look at anything that's likely to cause any harm and deny that information to citizens. And the definition of harm, the way harm has been defined in the law, is very, very vast. So it includes things like reputational harm, um, you know, things like blackmailing, etc., which which RTI users are regularly kind of uh, accused of. But if if somebody wants to file an RTI application which exposes corruption, of course it will cause reputational harm to the person who's corrupt. So should we not have that information out in the public domain? There are very strong penal provisions in the privacy law which would make public information officers very wary of giving any information which might make them fall on the wrong side of the law. So what we have today really is by way of the data protection bill potentially a very, very chilling effect on the right to information. We have a situation where the balancing of the two rights of the right to information which can and has proven to be immensely important for public accountability, not being adequately balanced with the right to privacy. So for example, uh, you know, the way uh, data which is personal is defined and sensitive personal data is defined, today all the kinds of information that people have fought very hard for to be put in the public domain would technically not be available. So for example, uh, we know that students who uh, belong to certain communities and are therefore given reservations in schools, in jobs, don't get them unless and until they actually have access to data about who's getting it, what are the criteria and so on. And it's very likely that if this sort of an uh, a, a legal framework comes into being for privacy, all that information could disappear from the public domain and even not be accessible under the right to information law. I'll stop here because I know that there's a time constraint. Thank you. Thanks, Anjali. I mean, it, it really looks like privacy is turning out to be a bit of a double whammy in some sense. That, you know, where, where it needn't work or shouldn't, you know, really work against public interest, it is working and where it should in some ways, you know, come in the way of the state, you know, intruding upon citizens' rights, it seems to not be working much. I mean, at least if you look at the Aadhaar verdict. Uh, but uh, Bhavin, the other interesting part about the verdict is the way it looks at private authentication, right? And now there is a lot of criticism, you know, saying that the, the, the privacy debate is one that's going against the whole principle of innovation, right? I mean, in a big data economy, how do, how do private actors innovate and, and uh, we'd like to hear your thoughts on how that trade-off has been navigated and is, you know, in, in the works in India. Good morning. Uh, my name is Bhavan Patel. I represent a small legal consultancy based in Bombay called Bayside Advisors. We work with a number of new businesses, primarily in the fintech space with NBFCs, with banks, and so on and so forth. And uh, I've been asked to speak about the trade-off between innovation and privacy. And as Rishabh pointed out before when we were speaking, there really isn't one. The entire debate around innovation and privacy is usually framed in one of two contexts. The first is this seeming conflict between large data fiduciaries which aggregate vast amounts of data and the interests of individual data principles. That's one way of looking at it. 
And the other is this sort of uh, tension between entrepreneurial ambitions on the one hand and a legislative regime like the one under the Aadhaar Act or the new Personal Data Protection Bill. But what I'd like to point out today is that the story of innovation and privacy in India today is really one of a conflict between innovation and having to navigate a minefield of regulatory conflicts and confusions. And that's really the apprehension that's been caused in the minds of innovators today when one looks at the new proposed data protection bill. Here are a few of the points that I'll be talking about. And just to sort of frame this again, let me give you a little anecdote from the story that I'm talking about. Since the 26th September judgment on Aadhaar, the Aadhaar regulator has been issuing private circulars to various forms of regulated entities, which we read about in the papers, not accessible to us, either on the regulator's website or otherwise, that contain certain directives about how you could use Aadhaar still to do KYCs to open bank accounts through something called an XML verification or an offline verification and so on and so forth. Now, we haven't read these, but we've had banks and NBFCs come to us and talk about how there, is, there are contradictions between what those private circulars say, what the judgment says, and what sectoral regulators like the RBI says. So you've got banks coming to us and saying, look, if I follow what the UIDI says, I'll be violating what the RBI tells me to do. If I do what the RBI tells me, I'll be violating what the UIDI tells me to do. What am I supposed to do? And if large banks are in this situation, pity the poor innovator in the garage who's trying to start a new business because that's never going to take off. Before we go into any of these, however, let's just look at a little bit of what innovation really needs or wants. There are a few basic things that you need to have if you're trying to get a new business off the ground. The first is the ability to know your customer. And this goes beyond just onboarding or simple transactional data. You need to be able to develop a view of what the customer wants. You need to be able to predict requirements. You need to be able to prepare for them. You also need to be able to access your customer. And this is not a simple question of mailing lists or telephone numbers that you can start cold calling people and selling credit cards to. Um, you need to be able to build a competitive advantage over large established players. You need to be able to build an ecosystem of partners in a country as large and vast as India. And unless you have clear guidelines on what sort of information or data you can share with them, this becomes well nigh impossible. And of course, you need to be able to comply because if you don't, all the other points don't make sense at all because you won't have a business left to run. Now, when it comes to being able to comply, everybody doesn't have 1,145 crores to pay out in legal bills in one year like Amazon Seller Services does. But as I'll point out, the regulatory regime is just so confusing that you're left wondering whether you should invest money in your business or paying them to your lawyers. Now, there has been very poor guidance or clarity available from the one regulator, the one visible regulator we've had in the personal data protection space in India today. Responses to queries or requests for clarifications go unanswered. You're unable to figure out whether or not, for example, after the 26th September judgment, an Aadhaar is what is called in the regulations an OVD, or an officially valid document, which you can present as a proof of identity to open a bank account. We don't know. No innovator really is going to be able to read 1,500 pages of a Puttaswami judgment and figure out the answer for themselves. I haven't finished 1,500 pages myself yet. Right? And then again, it's been over a month and a half, and we still don't know what the appropriate mechanism for onboarding new customers is. The telecom sector has seen some guidance from the Department of Telecommunications, and they've proposed a new paperless mechanism to onboard customers, which we understand has been implemented based on the suggestions of industry bodies and associations. That sector is at a relative advantage, but the finance ministry and the RBI are still to propose an alternative me mechanism that works and that is paperless. Again, when we talk about innovators who want to start new businesses and build information about their customers, you know, there is this bogeyman of the entrepreneur who wants to profile every single customer for targeted marketing and so on and so forth. That may well be the case in some instances. But bear in mind that profiling is mandated under certain regulatory requirements in India. One very visible example of this is the rules relating to know your customer, or AML, which is anti-money laundering, or combating the financing of terrorism. Now, regulated entities under these regimes are required to develop fairly detailed profiles of their customers so as to avoid the risks of things like money laundering and financing terrorism and so on and so forth. But here's what happens. 
the regulator will give you a very general set of guidelines that you could use to form these profiles. And then they'll leave it up to you to figure out what exactly you're supposed to do. Now, if you can't access data at a personal level, and if you can't build an accurate profile of a customer at an individual level, you start building profiles at a fairly general level, which comes with its own risks. One example of that risk is that an individual customer who, have done, who may have done nothing wrong whatsoever will get clubbed into a general category and be denied services. Some aspects of the proposed data protection regime seem to have been framed in a manner that's less than well thought out. It's difficult to imagine how you would implement some of these requirements. Um, I can talk on and on about what facial images mean under the new data protection bill and what rights I have in relation to those, but trust me, either you're going to spend all your time and money as a small startup trying to figure all of this out and trying to figure out how to implement it, or you're going to run your business. And both really can't happen together, especially for small innovators. Now, when I speak about the confusion or the conflicts between regulatory regimes, yes, any innovator who wants to take the advantage of working across sectors needs to be able to comply with sectoral regulations. That's only fair, and that makes sense. But not only are there sectoral regulations, within each of these, you have several different regimes for the very same issue. Now, when it comes to profiling itself, here's one simple list of the profiling regimes that, re that exist in India and that various entities may be bound by. So under the Prevention of Money Laundering Act and the rules they're under and the regime they're under, you have this classification which includes bodies governed by the RBI, the SEBI, the Insurance Regulatory Authority, and casinos, and dealers in precious stones and jewelry, and, and so on and so forth, and it's mind-boggling. It's understandable that each of these present possibilities of money laundering and fraud. It's understandable, therefore, that they need to have a common minimum standard of checks and verifications that they need to do in order to allay these risks and concerns. But if that's the case, it's very difficult to imagine why variations are permissible across all of these, if the stated intention of KYC is the same across all of them. It's difficult to imagine why, when there was a central body constituted called the Central KYC Registry, to handle KYC information across all of these so that consumers wouldn't have to keep producing paper documents over and over again, why that hasn't been implemented and why variations have been permitted in the manner in which each of these sub-regulators have implemented these schemes. I just want to take a few more seconds to show you one example of the sort of regression that has taken place, not so much because we're concerned about privacy. Innovators are private individuals with privacy concerns of their own as well but about the manner in which regulators seem to mishandle this. Ever since Aadhaar eKYC was purportedly banned, and we read stories in the Times of India four days ago saying how banks are still doing it, let's pretend they aren't, we're forced to go back to a system where you're no longer authenticating the person. You're back to a system of now verifying, and authentication and verification, of course, are defined terms and they have meaning, verifying physical documents against their photocopies. So instead of being able to identify who exactly you're entering into a transaction with, you're now looking at paint on plastic, and you're comparing it against paint on paper with a human sitting at a desk and sign on, signing off on it saying original seen and verified. How does this make any sense at all? And why haven't we, why haven't we received any guidance all the way from the 26th of September until now, which employs systems that allay privacy concerns, that uses, as Anjali pointed out, appropriate technologies, such that the control of this identity information is in the hands of the data principle, rather than a centralized database like the CIDR or the Aadhaar and so on and so forth. Now, it's not all doom and gloom. Um, we note with a welcome sigh of relief Section 61 of the Personal Data Protection Bill, which at least lays the framework for a consultative approach to the framing of any regulations and rules, and we hope that the voices of industry bodies, of private players, as well as of data principles, as well as of representatives of consumer associations are heard, and there may well be a chance that we get a regulatory regime that works. I wouldn't hold my breath. Thank you. Thanks, Bhavin. I mean, I think uh, the issue of regulatory Coordination has been one, you know, which keeps uh, all of us, you know, engaged when it comes to emerging technologies of any kind. And with data, it seems to be even more problematic because 
Now the data protection bill talks about a data protection authority, but then each entity has, you know, been doing what each rec sectoral regulator does, what it feels is the right way to handle data. Localization is another very good example of that, and we have, you know, Rishabh uh, addressing us in the next uh, panel on some of that as well. So, Ambar, now coming to you, the third major trade-off that the Supreme Court identifies is that of law enforcement and national security. So, we'd like to hear your thoughts on how the privacy versus security debate is uh, playing out and what are the safeguards that citizens have against uh, state action. Thanks, Anand. Hi, uh, good morning. My, my name is Ambar Sinha and I work as a researcher for an organization called the Center for Internet and Society. If you look at the, the evolution of, of privacy as, as a right uh, in, in, in the legal domain, essentially the, the story of the evolution of privacy is very much the story of the evolution of surveilling technologies. And if one has to go back to the 1890s when Warren and Brandeis wrote the seminal Harvard Law Review article where they identified privacy as, as the right to be let alone, uh, there the technology that they were dealing with was the scourge of uh, point-and-shoot Eastman Kodak cameras, which they felt uh, sort of was a paradigm shift in, in the way you know, personal details about individuals were recorded. And in fact, over the last few years, essentially the, the, the topic of privacy has been brought front and center by the revelations made by uh, the whistleblower Edward Snowden. And even in India, I think if you look at from, from 1950 onwards, if you look at the Supreme Court jurisprudence on how privacy has evolved, it essentially has to do with uh, how that right is juxtaposed against the right of, uh, of the state to surveil its citizens for either national security or domestic law enforcement purposes. Now, uh, essentially, if you look at the, the, the story of, of privacy in India, the, there are two stages uh, broadly that it follows. One is uh, the pre-Govan stage, at which point we didn't have a recognized right to privacy. And, and after... Uh, from 1970 onwards, uh, after the case of Govind versus State of MP, where we assumed that there was a right to privacy till about three years back when, uh, when the then Attorney General Mukul Rohatki stood up in the Supreme Court and said that there was no right to privacy. And that's the issue that we've dealt with over the last three years. So, uh, in the context of, of privacy and law enforcement, it's, it's also worthwhile to remember that during the Constituent Assembly debates, the, the question of whether the right to privacy needs to be clearly spelled out in the Constitution of India was brought up. And much like the jurisprudence that would follow, the, the understanding of privacy uh, drew largely from the American jurisprudence. So the discussion in the Constituent Assembly debates also were largely about how or whether the Fourth Amendment protections of rights against unreasonable searches and seizure needs to be brought in to the Indian Constitution. And this assertion was at that point rejected. And that rejection formed the basis of, uh, of the judgments in, in the two cases that I mentioned here, the first two cases. Uh, the first being of MP Sharma, where there was a refusal to import the right against search and seizure of documents. Uh, and in Kharak Singh, which dealt with surveillance as, as it was largely carried out then, which involves activities such as secret picketing, domiciliary visits, inquiries into the habits and associations. Now, it's also worthwhile to remember that at this point, when we're dealing with the idea of privacy, privacy was essentially very much a proprietarian concept. It had to do with 
it's a very sort of uh, not not a dignity based idea of privacy but a very property based idea about the man being the master of his castle so to speak uh, and essentially when in Kharak Singh, certain uh, these practices were read down. They were not read down on the basis of the right to privacy, but they were read down on the basis of, of a person having access to, uh, to a peaceful access to his, to his or her dwelling. Uh, what we also see, however, is, is the emergence of the idea of, of targeted and specific surveillance around these cases. So in both Kharak Singh and, and Aram Malkani, which followed it a few years later, when we were dealing with whether a certain kind of state action which infringes on one's personal space is valid or not, the decision seems to turn, uh, without actually calling it out in those words, but the decision seems to turn on whether, uh, on who we are surveilling, on whether there is a ra rational nexus between surveillance of certain persons and the objectives that are sought to be carried out by law enforcement agencies. And there, uh, I think in, in Arun Malkani, the, the term which actually gets used is that guilty persons can be surveilled, but those who are innocent cannot be, without going into the question of how guilt could be determined without uh, the procedure being followed at all. But what we do see, while there is some confusion in the jurisprudence at this point, we do see a clear uh, focus on the idea of surveillance being tied to being specific and being targeted. Uh, this, this begins to change from the 1970s onwards in India when in the case of Gobind versus State of Madhya Pradesh, the court supposedly held, upheld a right to privacy. This was again called into question uh, during the hearings in the Supreme Court in the Puttaswami case uh, last year, but I'm not going to go into the technicalities of whether Gobind actually upheld a right to privacy or not. For the last 30 years or so, we believed that it did, so we will proceed with that understanding here. Uh, and the, the two things that Govin brought about was also introducing the concept of compelling state interest and that of narrow tailoring. Now, compelling state interest in that sense uh, was read as the determinant criteria uh, when we are dealing with right to privacy as part of Article 21. And this was an entirely new criteria which was read into the Indian Constitution. Uh, under Article 19, which deals with different kinds of freedoms, there is the idea of state interest, the public interest, as one of the uh, reasonable restrictions that can be imposed on a fundamental right. But the use of the word compelling here clearly suggested that when we are dealing with the right to privacy in the context of state surveillance, there is a greater bar that the court sought uh, to introduce as uh, th that the law enforcement agency needed to satisfy. The other important uh, concept that comes about here is that of narrow tailoring, uh, where the court very clearly articulated that merely because the there is a legitimate purpose behind uh, a surveilling activity, the way uh, it must be read is that it must be tied to the aims and objectives of behind that purpose and must be tailored in the most narrow fashion. And what we also see in Gobind is, 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 a, uh, is a clear shift from a propertarian view of privacy to a more dignitarian idea of privacy. And the, the judgment very clearly calls out that privacy resides not in places but in persons. Uh, after that, we see a few cases which deal with you know, other ways of surveillance. In Malak Singh, the idea is about the inclusion in a particular surveillance register. In PUCL in the 1990s, the, the issue that we were looking at was telephone tapping being carried out under the Telegraph Act, uh, which I will deal with a little more in detail in the next slide. Uh, another very important case was Collector versus Canada Bank, where we were looking at the search and seizure of private records. And, and I specifically call this case out because of this uh, passage that I have included in the slide, that the possibility of any wild exercise of such power may be remote, but then on the framing of the provision, the possibility cannot be ruled out. So what essentially the Supreme Court is calling out here is that merely because uh, 
the, the collection of the data itself uh, by, by its own fact may not lead to any clear privacy harm to the individual in question. But it still raises the issue of, of such collection leading to those harms without proper uh, procedures being in place. So what we've seen over the course of years uh, is the idea of privacy when it is juxtaposed against different kinds of surveillance, whether it is physical surveillance, such as secret picketing, uh, or domiciliary visits, whether it is surveillance in the context of the ability to seize uh, and search for certain documents, or uh, as we see in PUCL, uh, whether it's telegraphic surveillance, which involves telephone tapping, and in more recent times, the, the kind of surveillance issues that we're dealing with are much more uh, widespread and prevalent. Uh, so if we look at widely recognized principles of surveillance governance and we try to evaluate the state of surveillance governance in India against that, uh, it sort of presents a slightly, a fairly sorry picture. The first uh, question is, is that of valid legislative backing, and this is very clearly spelled out uh, in the Puttaswamy judgment. I think as Anant mentioned in his presentation, the, the, the three-part test that Puttaswamy articulates in its uh, plurality opinion uh, clearly looks at as valid law as, as one of the, as the first sort of part of that test. Legitimate aim similarly is another uh, part of that test. Uh, However, this, despite the Puttaswamy judgment having called that out very clearly, uh, if we look at the range of surveillance practices that exist in India, most of them don't have any legislative oversight. Uh, uh, most of them haven't been subjected to any kind of judicial overview. The judiciary has by and large been hesitant to enter into matters which they deem as falling under the purview of state security and have left that entirely to the executive to determine. Uh, even in the PUCL judgment where finally there were certain procedures which were established which needed to be followed uh, before say things like telephone tapping could be done. Those procedures are also largely reflected in, uh, in the context of electronic surveillance under the Information Technology Act of India. Uh, even in those cases the, the idea of a judicial review was not something that the court felt was important enough to impose as an obligation. And by and large, uh, based on press releases, based on uh, statements made in the Parliament of India, and based on RTI applications that different actors have made, we have some knowledge of different kinds of surveillance projects and schemes that exist in India, and some prominent ones include uh, something called the Central Monitoring System, or the CMS, which essentially uh, serves to link the existing uh, intelligence uh, collected both at the state and central level and provide a kind of a central API to access that without really going into the question of the procedure for getting permission to access that based on CMS. There are other, uh, the, the telecom licenses that uh, the ISPs and the telecom companies in India need to enter with uh, with the government involves very, very broad framing of the kind of surveillance uh, devices that telecom operators need to have in place and clearly raise the question of back-end access being provided to law enforcement agency and other uh, agencies of the government uh, when those requests are faced by these companies. So while the Puttaswamy judgment clearly calls that out, it also doesn't really go into the question of the, the public knowledge that we have about surveillance uh, programs that exist without any legislative backing and without any examination of leg legitimate aim, necessity, or proportionality, let alone the question of judicial review. Similarly, uh, as far as you know, due process of a fair and public hearing within a reasonable time is concerned, uh, we don't have very clear procedures because there is no idea of user notification. Uh, and I think I covered the, the issue of oversight in, uh, a little bit earlier. So what we have in India is, is the, the right to privacy has evolved primarily in the context of state surveillance. Uh, we have now a fairly resounding uh, and 
fairly unequivocal position as far as the position of law and privacy is concerned and what ways that right to privacy can be curtailed. However, there is uh, a complete uh, lack of consideration to this point on how those principles can be implemented across these different surveillance schemes. Thank you. Thanks, Ambar. I mean, I think that's very insightful to know that while the principles are sort of laid down at a, a high level, you know, and then to say that there is a fundamental right to privacy, when it comes to applying it to specific, you know, surveillance schemes, we haven't really made much progress. Uh, because we are running short on time, we have about 10 minutes uh, for Q&A and uh, the mics passed around. So questions to the panel. And uh, uh, that UIDAI had issued some circular and then there are contradictory uh, directives from the RBI and how is it that uh, UIDAI is not, I mean, I, I don't know, listening either to the re regulator or the government because I'm not sure how that uh, entity works. If I'm, I'm sorry, I missed the last sentence. Could you go over that again? I just wanted to know if, uh, I mean, does UIDAI not have to report to either, uh, or, you know, I mean, I know it does not have to report to the RBI, but does it not have to, I don't know, like at least get a sign off from the government before issuing circulars of its own to banks? But seemingly not, and, and that's the whole point. This particular area, which I was talking about, is related to KYC in order to, for example, create new bank accounts. Now, as far as I understand it, the root for all of this comes from the Prevention of Money Laundering Act, which comes from the Finance Ministry, which comes from international obligations, so on and so forth. The UIDI has nothing whatsoever to do with this. But consider a situation where up until the 26th of September, you are serving out millions of requests every single day, and then suddenly you have nothing left to do. So, one is tempted to call this the existentialist flailings of a failing regulator, but no, there is no clear discernible reason why the UIDI should be telling banks how they go about KYC and how they should open bank accounts. And the policymakers are not even aware of this, so they are and they're not doing anything. Would that well, <laughs> I'm not sure I can answer that, but all I can tell you is that these circulars are so private that we haven't seen them. We've only read reports about them in the papers. And if you happen to have a friend who works with, for example, a PPI provider or a bank or NBFC and has WhatsApp installed and sends you an image, then you may or may not have seen it. <laughs> right, okay. Bastian Weber from the German Embassy here in New Delhi. I have a question to you, ma'am. You were talking about uh, that the government uses the right of privacy to uh, hide information from people. So my question would be, does the Indian law know something like the right of information, which exists uh, in my country, where I come from, like when I want information about data or something from my government, from the administration, I have a right to get this information normally? So in India, we have a right to information law, which uh, provides a basic framework for people to be able to access information from the government. And like I mentioned, there are exemptions that are listed out, what information we can't have. And those are fairly narrowly defined in terms of um, national security. You know, there are there is also an exemption for unwarranted invasion of privacy. So if somebody asks for information that legitimately falls under that category, it can be exempted. What I was referring to was that there is a tendency in the government, and we've seen that almost 40% of denials analysis shows uh, of information by the government is under the pretext of privacy. And a lot of information which, in fact, is critical for public accountability, and especially in a context where we have widespread corruption in India, and corruption actually does go down to the lowest levels and impacts people's ability to be able to, to access the rights and entitlements, that information is denied to people under the pretext of privacy. Now, 
all of those denials are not legitimate many of those denials are not upheld by any of the adjudicators but the government continues to do that i also talked about public records not being shared with people so for example when people are asking about the educational qualifications of ministers they are told that the results are private information whereas these are matters of public record these are public universities and put out their results regularly in the public domain but the government is hiding behind the exemption of privacy and not giving out that information which to us is illegal denial using privacy and the problem is that on the one hand the government is using the uh, the bogey of privacy to not give information to citizens when they are asking for it under the RTI law on the other hand when it comes to collecting people's information and under a program like the aadhar the government is not really sort of worrying about privacy concerns and which is what we were discussing that um, the government went on in the supreme court to say that people don't have a fundamental right to privacy so that's the context now that the mic is right next to me i might just as well Björn Ratzinger also from the german embassy i have a question for you bavin because right at the beginning of your presentation you said that you do not necessarily see a trade off between innovation and data privacy and um i was wondering if you could elaborate on that a little bit more because the narrative of big data tells us exactly that companies that innovators need um as much data as possible to be able to um cater their products or services to customers so i'll answer that by picking up that last part yes innovators and people who work with big data need as much information as possible in order to create new products and services as as one example there's no problem with that the proposed regime doesn't prevent or prohibit that in any manner it puts some safeguards which may or may not work in the appropriate manner for that to happen the very concept of innovation or the idea of developing a disruptive business is that you are able to work within clear boundaries of regulation and come up with ways of achieving this there are some concerns about potential future uses of big data applications that you can't well predict right now but again there is there are mechanisms that you can employ to anonymize data to store it for longer durations until you are able to identify these specific purposes in the future nobody's got a problem with that the problem is when you don't know what the rules are and what you can and can't do there are no further questions we can take a short 10 uh, minute coffee break and then come back for the next panel on personal data protection bill uh, let me thank all of you you know who take took the time out to explain the various trade offs that privacy is uh, facing in in the indian context and the nuances as it is playing out in india uh, thank you all so much <laughs>